Here we're going to look at some basic skills for visualizing complex functions, and we're going to do it with a very simple example. Before we get into it, I'd like to recall the polar form of a complex number. This is a really important form for a complex number when using it to visualize the action of a complex function. So if we've got a complex plane here, so the horizontal axis is the real axis, the imaginary axis is the vertical axis, and then we've got an arbitrary complex number z equals a plus bi, then it also has a polar form or maybe a complex exponential form written as follows, r e to the i theta, where r is the distance from the origin or the modulus of the complex number, and theta is the angle made by this ray and the positive real axis. And this like makes sense as a polar form because of the Euler's formula expansion of e to the i theta as cosine theta plus i sine theta. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, including some more basics and some more advanced stuff, you should check out my second channel where I post course videos. And the name of that channel is Math Major. It's linked in the description. And I'm building a full complex analysis course on that channel right now. Okay, so the function that we want to look at today is the function f of z equals z squared. So if we were working with real numbers, like f of x equals x squared, we would just graph that in the Cartesian coordinate plane. We would have an input axis and an output axis, an x-axis and a y-axis. But we can't quite do that with complex valued functions, and that's because our input is an entire plane, and our output is also an entire plane. So the proper graph is actually four-dimensional. So we've got to have some sort of other strategy for finding out the action of this function. So let's work through some examples of what happens to points under this map, and then we'll end by looking at some examples of what happens to lines under this map, and then I'll leave you guys with some kind of questions to think about as we finish up. Okay, so let's say we originally say that z is equal to r e i theta, then that means that f of z, which is z squared, is r squared e to the i 2 theta. So let's see what this means. This means that the distance from the origin has gone from r to r squared. So that means if r is bigger than 1, it's gotten larger. If r is less than 1, it's contracted a little bit. Because numbers like 1 half, when you square them, you get something smaller, like 1 quarter. Then the argument, in other words, the angle from the positive real axis has doubled. So if we were to draw like an arbitrary complex number here, let's say it's out here. So let's say this is our number z. And... It has this angle and this distance from the origin. So there's our theta, there's our r. So if we were to apply our map, so our map is the function f, then we would end up with something like this. So notice that theta will be changed to 2 theta, that angle will be doubled, and then r will be either contracted to r squared or expanded to r squared, depending on the size of r. Let's say the r is bigger than 1, so it gets expanded. So it'll look something like this. So maybe this would be the output, this number right here, which is z squared. So let's notice that our angle has doubled from theta to 2 theta, and then our distance from the origin has expanded from r to r squared. Again, if r was less than 1, it would have contracted. I'll let you guys draw the picture for that. Okay, so now that we've got the feel for what happens to an arbitrary z, let's look at a couple of examples of specific points before we move on to the image of lines under this map. Okay, so I've got my picture started. So I've got a complex plane over here, which is the domain of our function f of z equals z squared. And I've got a complex plane over there, which is our codomain or our range of the function f of z equals z squared. Furthermore, I put some points on this domain that we'll look at as they map under this function. So let's start with these points along the real axis. So it shouldn't be a surprise of how these work. 
So if you square the number two, you'll get the number four, which is about out here. Well, what happened to the modulus and what happened to the argument? Notice the argument doubled from zero to two times zero, which is still zero and the modulus expanded from two to two squared or four. Now let's likewise look over here at negative two. So if you square negative two kind of naively, you'll get four again. So we land on this point more than one time. And furthermore, if we look at the argument, the argument here is pi. If we double the argument pi, we get two pi, but two pi for an argument is the same thing as zero for the argument because our exponential function is two pi i periodic. Okay, so both of these green points over here map onto this green point right here. Okay, so now let's move on to these two points, i and negative i. So let's start by kind of thinking of them naively. So naively, if we square i, we get negative one. If we square negative i, we also get negative one. But also, here the modulus for each of these is one, and the angle for i is pi over two. If you double that angle, you get pi. But what number has a modulus of one and an argument of pi? It's the number negative one. Notice that number is like over here like this. Then furthermore, this guy down here has angle, you could think of it maybe as minus pi over two, it's a little bit easier. You double that to minus pi, that's back to the negative real axis. So either way you look at it, these two pink dots here map onto this pink dot negative one. Okay, so now let's move on to this point right here, one plus i. Well, through some pretty simple calculation, you can see that this is of the form the square root of two e to the i pi over four. So in fact, you can kind of see that the argument should be pi over four given that the real part and the imaginary part are the same. So it obviously makes a 45 degree angle, which is a pi over four radian angle. So if we square that, the square root of two will become two, and then e to the i pi over four will become e to the i pi over two, but e to the i pi over two is i, because that's a 90 degree or pi over two radian from the positive real axis. So that's up here like this. I'll put here, this is two i. And then there's another point over on this side that also gets mapped to this point two i as well. It's negative one minus i. I think you can see kind of this trend that if a number maps to something over there, then the negative of that number also maps. This is a so-called two to one function. Okay, so let's look at one more example. Let's take negative one plus i and see what happens there. So the modulus is still square root of two for the same reason that we saw before. And then our angle here is three pi over four. So if you double the angle three pi over four, you get three pi over two, which is the negative imaginary axis. So that means this thing goes down here to negative two i. And then likewise, it has a companion, which is over here about like this, one minus i, which also gets mapped to negative two i. Now, furthermore, if you look at rays from the origin to any of these points, you can produce line segments or rays over there that are the image of those. So for instance, if we take the positive real axis here, or I should say the entire real axis over here in the domain, that will get mapped to this, the non-negative real axis over here in the co-domain. And then likewise, if we take the imaginary axis over here in the domain, that's gonna get mapped to the negative real axis over here in the co-domain. Notice these guys overlap here at the origin. So that's shaded green and pink. Okay, now what about this? If we look at the line here, which is like a line y equals x or the line with 45 degrees, well, everything on here has an angle or an argument of pi over four or three pi over four, but if you double that, it's the same thing as rotating this line into place, making the imaginary axis.
making the positive imaginary axis. So this one gets rotated into place, but then since this angle is more, it gets kind of rotated around. And then likewise, this line right here through these two points will become the negative real axis. Okay, nice. So that's kind of a picture of what happens here. Notice that there's some sort of spinning and collapsing of this plane into parts over there. Okay, nice. So let's maybe clean this up and we'll look at some other examples. So here's another interesting example. Let's see what happens if we look at all of the points along this line, which is the vertical line through the real number one under this map f of z equals z squared. So let's first note that everything along this line is of the form one plus y times i. The imaginary part is free here. Okay, well let's start by looking at the image of some special points. Then after we do that, we'll kind of expand that to the entire line. So the point one will obviously be mapped to the point one. So let's maybe shade this in green. It kind of blends in, but I think that's okay. So this get map, gets mapped to the point one. Then maybe this point up here, which is the point one plus I, which we looked at in the previous example, will get mapped here to the point two times i, for exactly the same reason as it did in the previous example. Then this point may be down here, which is the point one minus i, will get mapped down here to negative two i. Again, kind of for the same reason. And then we can work out some things in the middle if we wanted to. So let's, for instance, look at this point right here. So this is one plus maybe i over two. So let's do a little side calculation. One plus i over two times one plus i over two. So what is that gonna give us? So let's see, our real part will be one times one minus half times half, so that'll be three quarters. And then our imaginary part will be exactly I, so that'll be three quarters plus I. Okay, so where does that live over here? Well, I think we can graph that pretty easily. Three quarters plus I is about right here. Okay, nice. And then likewise, this point down here, which is one minus I over two, will share like some fairly nice symmetry with this point, which is something like this over here. So we could maybe kind of play it fast and loose and assume that we have something kind of smooth between all four of those points that we've graphed and then talk about the end behavior of this. Okay, so let's say we've got this to start out with. But now let's argue what happens as we move in this direction. So as we move up this direction, what's happening to the argument? So the argument of z is approaching pi over two. So we can see that because the y value or the imaginary component of this number is far outpacing the real component of this number. Then if you think about the argument of the, as the inverse tangent of y over x or the real part over the imaginary part, you can think about taking that limit uh, suffice it to say you'll get pi over two as you trend off that way. Similarly, the modulus will tend towards infinity. Okay, and then the same thing essentially is happening in this direction except the argument is tending towards minus pi over two. Okay, but I think that gives us some idea of how we should fill in the rest of this. So if the argument of the input is tending towards pi over two and we're squaring it, which, which means we're doubling the argument, the argument of the outputs should tend to pi. And then furthermore, if the argument of the input here is tending towards negative pi over two, the argument of the output should be tending towards negative pi. So we should get something that looks like this. So this is like sort of exploding off to the left-hand side here. And the growth of the real part is outpacing the growth of the imaginary part in a way to achieve this argument of these numbers approaching pi and negative pi.
Okay, so I think this is good. Maybe I'll leave you guys with one kind of nice homework problem to try. So as a nice homework problem, which builds off of the ideas that we've seen, maybe try to find the image of this line under our map z is sent to z squared. So maybe just kind of written in a not careful way, this is the line y equals x plus one, if we were to view this as the real plane, but in fact, this is the, um, the complex plane. Okay, so what do I mean in the complex plane? Well, it's the special line that goes through the complex number i and the real number negative one. And then maybe if you wanna expand on this on your own, think about some other curves for which you could look at the image under this map and maybe post some interesting one in the comments. And that's a good place to stop.